Several years ago, I was in this, okay, it was group therapy, and <laughs> we, we, were, we were sitting in a circle, like you do, and, and the guy, the facilitator said, tell us about your best day. Like, think back through, through your life, and, and, and what was your best day? And so we go around the circle, and we just emote, and we, we dump our stuff out. And, and I heard stories of cancer survival. I heard stories of birthdays, college graduation, bar mitzvahs. Um, I heard all these wonderful stories. I heard the story about this guy who had been sober for 10 years. But, but the thing, I picked up a pattern really quick is that none of us in that room had our best day by ourselves. If you think back through your best days, you weren't alone. And so I, I, I started now at parties. I'm that guy, okay? And, and I'm the guy who says, so I'm Hugh. Tell me about your best day because I'm curious. And I've discovered over and over and over again that everybody has their best day when there was somebody else. Well, almost everybody. There's always one guy, right? This guy, he messed the whole thing up. But, <laughs> so I'm talking to him, he's a mountain climber, right? And, and he's telling me about 3 a.m. and he's climbing the mountain and it, the gentle rain and, and he's feeling transcendent and with God and yada, yada, yada. And <laughs> he gets to the mountain peak, it's like 5.30, he sits, he faces east, he watches the sun come. It's a beautiful story. And, and the sun comes up and the darkness peels back. And he said, I felt just at one with the universe. And, and I'm crying. I mean, it's a beautiful story. He's doing a much better job in telling it than I am, right? And so I said, well, what'd you do then? He said, called my wife and told her about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so even that guy wanted to share his best day with somebody else. Like Zach said, I run a faith-based nonprofit uh, called Love Wins Ministries, and uh, we work with people who are chronically homeless. Now, you have to understand there's all kinds of homelessness, okay? Um, the single mom who lives at the shelter with her two kids and, like, still works, she's homeless. Uh, Jim, whose wife threw him out, so he's sleeping on his buddy Earl's couch, Jim's homeless. And Willie, who sleeps under the bridge down by the park and has for the last six years, Willie's homeless. But Willie is the only chronically homeless person in that group, okay? Chronic homelessness, persistent homelessness. The best guess, the best numbers we have tell us that's about 10% of the homeless population. So, and there's all kind of theories about why chronic homelessness happens. Uh, there are people who will tell you that the chronically homeless, there's not enough housing. If we just had housing, it'd make it go away. And then there are people who say it's a jobs thing. If we only had more jobs, it would go away. And then there are people who say that the chronically homeless are just lazy or they're, they're all drug addicts or they prefer living that way or whatever. And, and so there's all these theories. And all of those are kind of legitimate. But they're not the real reason. Fundamentally, I have come to decide through my work that homelessness is at its core a relationship issue. Fundamentally, the reason people are homeless is because they do not have good relationships. People, the truest thing I know, is that people who have deep, intimate relationships and a broad spectrum of social contacts do not become chronically homeless. They don't. And likewise, people who are chronically homeless, who claw their way back into mainstream society, they never do it by themselves. It does not happen. The only time it ever happens is when there is someone who is already stable, that would be us, who partners with them, who walks with them, who can um, be beside them and ag advocate for them until they have, however tenuous, a support structure. Christopher this morning talked about how 
Um, leaders need a support structure. They need a board of directors. Until Willie has that board of directors or that support structure, Willie's not coming out from underneath that bridge. Now I live in Wake County. Uh, that's in North Carolina where Raleigh is. And there's about 1,100 homeless people there at any given time. Not chronically homeless, just homeless. And our best numbers tell us that less than 200 of those people are chronically homeless. To put that in perspective, you could put all of them in this room and have chairs left over. So we're not talking about a huge number of people. Now, why do I think homelessness is a relationship problem? Because there is no way you can convince me that in a county that has 866,000 people living in it, that you can't find 200 beds somewhere. Okay? Somewhere. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or put you on the spot, but most of us probably have a spare bed nobody's using in our house. Okay? So it's not that we have a lack of beds. It's we have a lack of relationship with the people who need the beds. Now I can hear you thinking. Some of y'all are Twittering right now. Hughes lost his mind. <laughs> TEDx RTP. <laughs> but I can hear you, I can hear you Twitter now. No way is a homeless man coming in my house, let alone in my bed. There's no way. Get him out of here. Where's that hook? But I tell you that of course you would. I can guarantee you you would let a homeless person in your house or sleep in your bed if that person was your mom. If, it, if, if your mom was living on the street, does mom have a bed in your house? If your sister, if your daughter were living on the street, do they have a bed in your house? And you'd say, he's crazy again. My mom, homeless. My best friend, homeless. Never gonna happen, cannot happen. And I tell you, you are right. That cannot happen. And the reason it cannot happen is because they have you because they have you. You are what stands between them and homelessness. Chronic homelessness can be ended by a relationship. I believe that. I've seen it work many, many times. I've committed my life to it. But the more I do this, the more I understand that the problems of the world are at their core relationship problems. Again, not asking you for a show of hands. Any of us here unhappy with how much we weigh? <laughs> exactly. According to Consumer Reports, I guess they would know, um, the, <laughs> the most successful weight loss program out there, the most successful weight loss program is Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers. Now, you ever read the Weight Watchers stuff? It basically comes down to eat less food, Weigh yourself every week with a room full of people watching you. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a genius to know that if you want to lose weight, you eat less food. And pretty much everybody who's ever tried to lose weight does it by getting on the scale. You got to, it's at some point, right? The magic is in the room full of people. The magic is in having people walk next to you on that journey. Every day, all around the world, uh, millions of people um, stand together in a room and they proclaim publicly among their circle that they are powerless over alcohol in their lives. And, and for one more day, those people do not drink. Now, the 12-step model was started years ago, and it was primarily, it was originally by alcohol, it's anonymous. And since then, it, you know, people who overeat and people who shop too much and people, there's a declutterers anonymous or something. There's all these 12-step programs. But the magic is not in the 12 steps. The 12 steps don't have magic words, and 12-step purrs would tell you nobody does the 12 steps by yourself. The magic comes from standing in that room of people 
Again, having people walk with you on the journey. Now, you say, okay, Hugh, all right, I get it. We need people, people help us change. I understand that, but how do we change the problems of the world? How do we change countries? How do we change nationality, systems, powers? How does that happen? And I would tell you that, well, in the first place, countries don't start wars, people start wars, okay? And, and so we change individuals and we change the world. Don't believe me? 15 years ago, there was not one place, we can debate whether this subject is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm just talking about the subject, okay? 15 years ago, if you were gay, you could not get married in America. You just couldn't. And they did all these studies, and the vast majority of Americans thought getting married and being gay, bad thing. Okay? 15 years ago. Today, 2010, there are nine states and a district in America, <laughs> in America, where you can be gay and be married. Almost 20% of the United States is now safe territory for you if you are gay and married. What changed? What changed in those intervening 15 years? Did we become more enlightened? Did we have a better PR program for the gay marriage effort? No. The Pew Forum tells us that the number one indicator over whether someone will support gay marriage or not is if they have friends with a gay person. If you have a friend who is a gay person, you are two times, you are twice as likely to support gay marriage. What changed? Who we have relationships with changed. One more thing, one more example. In 2008, 17 million children in America, America, lived in homes where there was not enough food. 17 million. America. Remember all of us want to lose weight? Yeah, that country. Second fact is that Americans throw away 40% of the food we buy. 40%. You buy 10 bags of groceries, four of them are going in the trash. 40%. Now, how is those two numbers possible? How can we have 40% too much food, basically, and be obese, and have children starving? How does that happen? I'll tell you exactly how that happens. Because those children who are starving don't know you. Because you can't tell me, unless you're like Hitler or Jer Jeffrey Dahmer or somebody, you can't tell me that if you knew a kid who was going to sleep tonight, hungry, you wouldn't get him some food. Right? Okay, I'll put you on the spot. This is the participatory part. <laughs> yes. Okay, if you knew someone who was hungry tonight, you would get them food. Okay? So the reason those 17 million kids are starving is because they don't know you. They don't. Now, some people will tell you, Hugh, you're oversimplifying. It's a distribution problem. That's all it is. And I say, no. Because if you're in Durham and your sister's kid is in California and you found out your sister's kid is going hungry tonight, distribution system be damned. You would charge the very gates of hell itself to get food to that kid tonight. You would. You wouldn't say, well, you know, it's a distribution problem. Um, one day, someday, somebody will fix this thing. Until then, I'm going to vote for Obama. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. How does change happen? What causes us to change? Change happens because of the relationships we have. And if we ever want to, you know, Margaret Mead, famous quote, it's in everybody's signature, um, you know, on email, you know. And um, she reminded us that, that a small group of committed people can change the world. 
And in fact, it's the only thing they ever has. But it was a small group of people. It wasn't like a small Hugh can change the world. <laughs> or a small Mary can change the world. It was a small group of people. What I want to say, what I want the takeaway, what I want you to get, I'm not here to tell you step by step how we do this. Okay? My goal is not to sit here and give you the five easy steps to end world hunger. The problem isn't that you don't know how to do this, because you do. All of us have friends. All of us have relationships. All of us have people who we love and we care about and who we would charge through hell itself to get food to if they were hungry. The problem is not that you don't have relationships, it's who you have them with. It's who you have them with. Those 17 million kids who are hungry, they don't know you. Look, if we want to change the world, if we want to make the world better, if we want to heal the sick, feed the hungry, if we want to educate the ignorant, clothe the naked, then we're going to have to be friends with people who are hungry and sick and ignorant and naked. I'm not talking charity. I'm not. I'm talking relationships. I'm talking about love. I'm talking about loving your neighbor. That has a nice ring to it. Love your neighbor. Trademark. Cute. Um, in all seriousness, you know, I did study, um, AKA I looked on Wikipedia. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's on the internet, must be true. Um, the, uh, but, uh, the top 20 religions in the world all revolve around that core principle. Love your neighbor. Be compassionate for people who, who need you to be compassionate for them. Stand up for the underdog. What sucks when people do it to you, don't do that to people. That one might actually be trademark you. Um, <laughs> my idea is simple. That when we enter into relationship with each other, we change each other. We change each other. And, and then together, you and I, we can change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, hello, everybody.